Welcome back. We continue with the program. I'm Cheryl Hicks, and uh, I have the pleasure of leading our investment portfolio strategy for the Water Resilience Coalition, which is our, our next topic uh, of our discussion. So the WRC's investment portfolio strategy was launched last year alongside the UN Water Conference in, in March. Um, and today, uh, we will share with you the developments and, and updates and progress on that portfolio with an exciting um, set of, of speakers, our partners from investment managers who are aligned with our Water Resilience Coalition um, investment strategy. So the, the portfolio um, really aims to identify those investment opportunities that are also aligned with our joint goals for water resilience and, as we just heard, um, net positive water impact. And corporate impact investing is already a proven strategy um, in, uh, in climate action, and we also have the opportunity to leverage the capital markets for water. Unlocking new sources of capital um, for water alongside philanthropy to address our trillion dollar um, financing gap to achieve SDG 6. So here's the update. Um, in the last year, we've identified three major investment themes um, where we have significant opportunity for impact through these capital market funds. Water sanitation and hygiene access, where we have investment opportunities amounting to um, $470 million, um, which would uh, allow us to reach 50 million people with water sanitation and hygiene access. Oh, I'm, we're missing some logos here. And this is, of course, together um, with our partners uh, at investment firms who you'll hear from today. Our second theme in uh, water resilience infrastructure, including wastewater reuse um, infrastructure, for example, um, we have identified $250 million in investment opportunities, um, and that is alongside our partners at Water Equity um, and the Im investments um, of Aqua for All. And finally, in nature-based solutions, um, uh, $1 billion um, investment opportunity um, with significant um, impact on recharge um, targets um, across key uh, geographies of our basins with RRG and NatureVest. And um, we should not forget to mention that another criteria for identifying these different investment opportunities are that they're aligned with our 100 Basin strategy. So as you can see here, um, all of those investment opportunities making up 1.7 um, billion in investment opportunities available today to reach significant impact um, towards our goals alongside our philanthropy, unlocking these capital market investments to, um, to help really close that financing gap for water. And so with that, um, I will uh, invite up to the stage Josen Sluges from, um, from Aqua for All and Helga Debel from, uh, from Emerald VC. Welcome. So our, our first two speakers and, and partners in this investment strategy uh, will share with us some insights from the, the global um, markets for investments in, in water. And first of all, Josen, welcome. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope that uh, towards the end of this ses session, we can agree to act and we have an understanding how. Many of you have replenishment targets and you've agreed to the 100 Basin strategy. You're part of the CEO water mandate. And so there is no need for me to um, explain or address the sense of urgency. But aside from corporate targets, um, we know that for the sake of our own and mostly our children's future, we have no other choice. When I worked for Rabobank and later for the Dutch impact investors, the, I saw a lot of intrinsic motivation of people to invest in SDG-related topics and a willingness to scale these. But to achieve scale, public and philanthropic actors and private sector need to collaborate. And that is not always easy if you don't speak each other's language. So, and as bridging this gap is an important prerequisite for success, I decided to move to the other side of the table and became the managing director of Aqua for All Foundation. And as water being one of the most underfunded sectors, the challenge is huge. With resources entrusted to us by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I designed our dual approach, whereby we support third parties such as asset managers, financial institutions, and guarantee providers to be equipped to invest in water. We bring 20 years of extensive water and sanitation expertise together with a team that is able to design blended finance solutions for water. 
This means, for example, that when a fund wants to set up um, or wants to invest in water, they, we support them, um, for example, in allowing them a better understanding of the risk and the investment opportunities, but also how to create the highest impact. And in addition to that, we also provide them with junior equity, first loss trenches, for de-risking and to allow them to crowd in additional private capital. Currently, the Aqua for All portfolio includes work, working with six asset managers that set up, that set up funds uh, or investment vehicles, and we work with multiple financial is institutions across African and Asian countries. We support them in uh, de -risking, with de-risking capital, technical assistance, and cost-covering grants. We also have a portfolio of 150 private enterprises operating in the water sector and we provide them with smart grants. Our current blended finance portfolio is over $90 million. And the mobilization rate is 16. So that means for every dollar that we put in, the funds or financial institutions are able to crowd in a 16 fold of that amount. We are scaling our fund investment approach with funding from the Dutch and Swiss government uh, and a number of corporate foundations to allow a fund to crowd in that very important private capital. So those funds are providing either private equity to uh, enterprises or liquidity to financial institutions. What I've seen uh, in the water sector, where a lot of SMEs are operating to provide access to water, they need growth capital that is not at hand. But what I've also seen is that a larger share of the SMEs just simply want to go to their own local banks for you know, small investment loans or working capital. So this is the reason that we work with funds that do both, or uh, at least banks that are able to then allow um, their own clients to come to their banks and have specific and dedicated water uh, loans. In our pipeline, however, there is 15 more funds that want to set up either this private equity or liquidity uh, vehicles uh, and the total funding need um, is over 2 billion euros, out of which 300 million euros is needed for first loss tranches. So people ask me why I did not use the initial 40 million euro grant that I received from the Dutch government to make this work to set up my own fund. And I believe that when you work with public funding, you are obliged to be as transformative and as catalytic as you can possibly be. And that means that you need to facilitate others to do their jobs. And there are great examples of organizations that have set up their own funds, and you will hear their stories after mine. I want to emphasize how important they are. They are the ones that prove that water is an interesting asset class to invest in, and they are the ones that show track record and the performance. In short, I ask you to continue to invest in those um, uh, opportunities, but at the same time, I also ask you to understand that if we want water investments to be mainstreamed, reach out um, to us because we have a huge pipeline of uh, companies that are actually looking into possibilities of allocating private investments towards the water space. And you've mentioned before, there's Incovin, there's multiple others that are going to set up their, their next series of funds. And it's extremely important for us to make sure that we support these. Um, I thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to working with you. There's a trap behind us. Thank you. Um, so my name is Helge, as you can see. Uh, I work for a company called Emerald Technology Ventures. And um, what I want to share with you is basically connected to what we heard in the previous session about net positive water, and that we can definitely see this in our current portfolio already. Um, but before I do that, I give you a little bit of background. So Emerald Technology Ventures has been around for 25 years. We were one of the pioneers in the back then called clean tech sector. Now you would call it climate tech. We actually like to call it sustainable industrial technology investing. So we take equity stakes in smaller companies that have revenues between one to five million, are usually not profitable. 
We invest initially about four to five million, uh, and over the course of our investment uh, period in those companies, invest another two to three as, as things go. So this is our model. Um, we invest across different areas, energy, water, materials, mobility, uh, agriculture, robotics and automation, circular economy, really very broad. Uh, we're quite global. Our offices are in Zurich, in Toronto, and in Singapore. And within that organization, uh, I lead uh, our water activities. I've been with the firm for 20 years, almost 20 years now. Uh, by background, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, civil and environmental engineer. Um, yeah, and for, for the majority of the 20 years, I was on my own, and we invested in water maybe once every two to three years, quite a frustrating time. Um, then in 2020, we managed to raise a dedicated water fund uh, that is $100 million in size. The backers are Temasek, Microsoft, Ecolab, and Ski on Water. So with that, we grew the team, and today we invest in four companies per year. So quite, quite an increase, and it's, it's appropriate, as you would probably all agree to. Um, and what is interesting to observe is if we go back, we have been an investor in, in the space, in tech companies, because we believe in the, in the drivers out there to be sufficient for venture-grade returns, and we achieve that. Our companies, some of our previous companies, are owned today by DuPont, by uh, Xylem, by Suez. So that uh, helped to set the, the stage or set an example to attract more capital into such a fund that we manage today. And what is new today, and that's where I come back to the net positive um, water approach, is that within our portfolio now, uh, we have companies that clearly connect to water risks, uh, water opportunities, whatever you want to call it, or the proper economic value of water. Um, and partly, it was our investment fee, and partly, we actually made things happen. So if you look at water technologies as such, and you want to target uh, the areas where you truly have a positive, let's say, water quantity impact. Let's keep it simple for the time being. In my view, there are only three water tech areas where you can achieve that. One is irrigation, as we all know. The, the quantities of water that are, that are consumed there are enormous. The other one is leakage in our drinking water networks. And the third one I would call reuse or water usage and reusing it. So on the leakage front, I think it's fair to say that by us introducing one of our portfolio companies, Fido, uh, from the UK to Microsoft, we made things happen that Microsoft and today other companies collaborate with leak detection companies like Fido, as well as Arganova, also from our portfolio, to team up with municipalities, identify these leaks, ensure they are repaired, and the technology of Fido lends itself to actually verify that the leaks are truly repaired so that you then claim the volumetric water benefits and on a basin level, as, we, as, we, as you're well aware, can, uh, can have a positive impact with your, with your dollars as a, as a corporate. And the other area where it was actually part of our investment theme is the irrigation space. Uh, we came across a company far from where we usually invest, uh, Kilimo from Argentina, or the founders are in Argentina. Um, we invested in the past in efficient irrigation technologies. Uh, they were technically very convincing. The fee made uh, a lot of sense to us, but the adoption was lacking. Um, and we all know why that is. Uh, water is just not very expensive for farmers, and it cannot be very expensive. Uh, otherwise, we would have other issues. But it leads to this vicious cycle that efficient technologies are not adopted. Um, and Kilimo really, after providing a, uh, an efficient technical solutions to help the farmers to save water, pivoted to also become, if you will, a marketplace between the corporates that uh, are interested to uh, reach the replenishment targets in certain basins on this planet and uh, work with them and basically lead the collective action in that way. And uh, so we're very excited about that because it facilitates the adoption at a scale that we haven't seen, right? And I think it's just a starting point. I mean. This is what we do now in the current fund, that there is no doubt that we continue to be active across different basins globally with appropriate technology companies like Fido, like uh, Kilimo, but also others in the future. So I just wanted to share that with you, that um, it's nice to see the, uh, non, uh, the net positive water story or approach being, being at action already. Thank you.
Thank you, Yosin. Thank you, Helga. Um, we have a, a few minutes for, for questions um, for Yosin and, and Helga. And uh, to kick us off, because I, I know it takes you a minute to think of your questions, um, to kick us off, I wonder if both of you um, could just share uh, some of the discussions that we've been having about um, you know, specific alignment with our Hunter Basin uh, strategy and some of the opportunities. Yosin, would you start? Yes, sure. Oh, I think it's on. Is it on? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Um, Yes, of course, there's the commitment to the 100 basins, right? And uh, I think that, you know, operating in those basins, uh, there's multiple opportunities um, for uh, working together with financial institutions that operate in the vicinities. I think it's extremely important um, because everywhere where we work and we look at portfolios of banks that we work with, there's also SMEs that, you know, as you refer to, uh, work on uh, non-revenue water, um, but also simply the provisioning of clean water for uh, staff that is living in the vicinities of where you have your operations. And we all know how important it is to have access to clean water, to be able to you know, work efficiently, not become ill. A large share of the population in hospitals is due to waterborne diseases. Just simply having access to clean water in those basins is crucial. Thank you, Yosin. And, and uh, we'll pass over to Helga with the same question, but um, you saw in that chart I shared earlier what's in that current $1.7 billion um, portfolio and um, several of the funds that, um, that Aqua for All has invested in align with our priority basins, um, such as uh, um, investment, the investment opportunities in South Africa, in Kenya, um, across um, Asia, and uh, in some countries in, in Latin America. So this is, uh, these are some of the discussions lining up the, um, uh, the catalytic investments that, um, uh, that uh, Aqua for All can make that could also be aligned with, um, with the priorities uh, of those basin strategies. So thank you, Yosin. Okay. Yeah, maybe just uh, one additional comment on how we operate. Uh, we're very much used to working with corporates as a firm. Uh, we have 60 multinational corporates committing to the money that we invest. And part of it is obviously to allow tech investments to happen, but the main interest is to be an open innovation partner to them via the companies that we see. And um, so this can be purely technical, but now coming to the basin topic, uh, the new dimension is that we can also serve them now and on, in that regard, right? For example, with Microsoft and Ecolab, obviously they do act in these priority basins, but we are still scratching only the surface, right? We, we only, about a year ago, added our first Indian investment in the reuse space, industrial wastewater reuse. So there is no, there is no doubt that they will find ways to also work with them in India. But currently, the basins that we're addressing uh, with Microsoft and Ecolab are LATAM and, and Spain. So there's still, still lots to do. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Michael. Oh, there's somebody ready for you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Michael from Diageo. Uh, fascinating, really fascinating, and, and it's one of the best sessions yet, I think. So thank you both. Um, I was just going to ask about typically what the, uh, the typical rate of return was for your investors, and perhaps a hosing from Aqua for All. If you're a return from investing in WASH, i.e. at the lower end of poverty and, and those communities, uh, do companies generally reinvest their profits from that investment in yours into their own WASH activities, or do they reinvest it into your funds? Uh, I'm just understanding the model in which, particularly around WASH, but I understand also perhaps it's a relevant question for, for um for the infrastructure ones that, that you've invested in. Thank you for your question. So for example, if you look at the portfolios of the banks that we work with, um, the repayment rates are 98% uh, and up, which is uh, same, um, same as other portfolios providing credit to SMEs. So in that sense, you know, we've learned, we've seen, there is also um, a lot of evidence that's, um, that is out there from, um, for example, water equity that's also provided that kind of uh, information on, on how performance of the banks is and how it reflects in your fund as well. We're supporting water equity because they're very important in kickstarting you know, the provision of liquidity to financial institutions. And if you look at the private equity uh, funds that we support, um, we've just started to work with them, so I can't really talk to the performance yet, but but it is um, uh, average returns. So in the sense that you know we provide junior equity tranches, we provide first loss for them to then be able to attract additional investors that take senior tranches. Um, and it is 
very much aligned with their corporate strategies, their investment strategies. So there's not a lot of difference uh, if compared to other sectors. What we see, however, is that really understanding the water and sanitation space when it comes to risk or when it comes to, for example, the request of DFIs, European Investment Bank and others to have the knowledge in-house, this is where the problem is. And so this is what we are able to then provide. We're part of their technical committees, part of their technical assistance facilities to really make sure that the investments that they do are solid. Thank you. And did you want to come in on that one, Helga? You also asked me, right? Yep. Okay. So um, our, as, a, as a firm in general, uh, our returns net IRR are around 15 to 20 percent. And uh, I would argue water is not that much different. Argue, I can only say argue because we don't have the data yet. I can tell you on the exits that we generated in the past, they were somewhere between 15 to 30 percent IRR. So they were decent. Um, and again, that's necessary. I always say you need to be completely honest about your vehicle and how it fits to a company. And if you find the right company, you can generate these returns. And, um, and so for the current fund, so I cannot tell you much about the past because it wasn't a separate fund. So for the current fund, we're still in the portfolio building uh, phase but I would assume also to land at 15 to 20 percent. Great, thank you. Thank you, Josen. Thank you, um, Helga. And if you have more questions um, for Josen and Helga, I'm sure they'll be with us um, into the break. Uh, so thank you. And for our next portion of the program, um, we're really pleased to hear from um, some open investment opportunities uh, that have advanced. You've heard from uh, these partners before, uh, but their funds are advancing, and we wanted to be able to, to share with you um, some of the latest opportunities. Um, really exciting. Um, Kenzie from RRG and Elon from, um, from Water Equity. And we'll start with, with Kenzie. And you have slides, so this is the, yep. you can advance with the green. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, Kenzie Reynoso. Hope you're all having a great and productive climate week. I'm sure you're all getting your steps in. Um, thank you, for, thank you, Cheryl, for including us in this conversation. Um, so RRG has been investing in water, agriculture, renewable energy, and conservation projects for over 20 years. Our water investments are primarily located in California's Central Valley, so the California Basin, where the state is witnessing, as you all know, a dramatic shift in water management dynamics. Over the past three decades, surface water supplies have become increasingly challenged because of aging infrastructure and expansion of permanent crops, so hardening of the water demand in this area, and climate change. Um, and farmers are relying more heavily on groundwater to water their plants, which has led to uh, severe critical overdraft. The image that you see here on the right um, is a groundwater recharge basin, which we have developed to put surface water back into the aquifer, creating new water supplies for the valley. So it's just a visual. Um, doesn't always look this great. Uh, most of the year it's, a, it's dirt, but during the season, um, it's, it's, it's really incredible to see. So RG is a private equity real assets asset manager. We have 2.3 billion in AUM, and we have over 50 investment professionals, including hydrologists, agronomists, data scientists, renewable energy experts, and we uh, are very proud to be a, a B Corp, a certified B Corp. And we are also we take great pride in having boots on the ground in all of the geographies that we invest in and deep relationships on the ground. So the primary way that we invest is through our fund, the Sustainable Water Impact Fund, or SWIF, which had its final close in right as the world shut down in April 2020 on uh, $927 million. And the fund is now 95% allocated across 14 deals, 60% in the Western US, 25% in Latin America, and 15% in Australia. We are um, managing 85,000 acres of sustainable land and 25 plus thousand acre feet of water. Um, we're, tracking, we're tracking towards our target of high teens gross returns, and we're really proud to, to collaborate with the Nature Conservancy on SWIF. So sustainability and impact are embedded throughout our investment process from underwriting to business plan execute, execution, and our colleagues at TNC work really closely with us as technical advisors to the fund. They help us to, they provide us with rigorous scientific 
uh, a rigorous scientific approach to um, that's supporting our goals around environmental and social impact. And um, the four areas that we focus on um, around impact are water resiliency, sustainable ag, biodiversity and habitat conservation, and climate mitigation. And you can see our impact reports and we regularly um, report out on, on our progress. Um, so I think the best way to illustrate what we do, because it can be kind of esoteric, is just a quick case study. So a great example is our first investment in SWIFT, which is Caponero Creek. Um, it was a 7,300-acre dairy farm um, in the Central Valley, uh, which was used mostly for the dairy operations, but then also there were 6,000 acres that were planted to alfalfa and other very water-intensive crops for the, to feed the cattle. So when we, we bought the land, we implemented a higher value land use change um, plan by closing down the dairy and looking at each individual parcel, um, which you can see in the map on the, on the upper right hand corner. So those were all different parcels that were all part of one um, asset. And we broke it down to see what the highest and best use of each parcel was, which included creating groundwater recharge basin, which was that image that you saw. And there's another image right here. Um, and then we have siting for potential solar development, adding, um, selling some of the land to conservation, which TNC helped us accomplish, um, which was land next to a national wildlife refuge. So it was very high value conservation land. Um, and it just shows you that it allows us to create value in many different ways and also have all different types of buyers for our assets. And the circle that you see in the middle right there is of birds um, that use our recharge for um, refuge when, along the Pacific Flyway. The last slide, very quickly, is just an example of the social benefit of um, the work at Caponero. We actually used a groundwater recharge basin um, right next to a, a, a low-income um, city, a town called Poplar, and actually we refilled the aquifer and the wells were in, 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 improved the quality of the water in that town. So thank you all very much and look forward to speaking to you more. Thanks. Um, great. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Ilan Emanuel, and I'm from Water Equity. It's really great to be here. Thank you to the CEO of Water Mandate for having us, um, and to all of you. It's great to see some familiar faces. Um, so for Water Equity, we are, I think, a bit unique uh, in, in, in an interesting contrast because we, uh, we are only focused on emerging markets. So we are a nonprofit asset manager that invests in enterprises, financial institutions, and infrastructure in emerging markets that are serving the water and sanitation needs of low-income communities. Um, similarly, we, uh, even though I'm here in the States, the vast majority of our team is based, we have boots on the ground in the countries that we invest in. We have experts in water and sanitation, experts in infrastructure, experts in financial institutions, um, and in all our fund strategies. Um, we have just launched our fifth fund. Uh, and we have about uh, almost a half billion assets under management and have been around since 2017. Um, and I think perhaps most interestingly, or at least I think so, about water equity is our relationship with our sister organization, water.org. So what water.org does is really a philanthropically driven organization, as, as was addressed in the opening remarks. There's a huge, there's obviously uh, an important symbiotic relationship between philanthropy and investment. So what water.org does is helps water equity identify pipeline opportunities, provide technical assistance to those investment pipeline opportunities, and ultimately help us de-risk our investments. And I say de-risk both from financial and an impact perspective, because that's the expertise that they would bring. Um, so we have, uh, uh, it's five minutes is a lot of time to only talk, a short amount of time to only talk about two investment strategies. But we really have two very distinct, but what we believe are complementary investment strategies. The first is, is very much similar to what Josian was just talking about. We invest in financial institutions that do make water and sanitation microloans to individuals. So you have to imagine a $300 loan, typically to a, a woman, 90% of our borrowers are women, who are using that to put a household level water and sanitation connection in their home. These are financial institutions that water.org has been working with for a long time to get them to refine and perfect their lending program. And once they're bankable, we come in and we scale. So that's really our, our idea of focusing on the demand at the household level for water and sanitation finance. Um, and that's been a proven strategy. And similarly, those loans are repaid back at a 98% rate, just as Josian mentioned. Uh, more recently, what we've decided to focus on is recognizing, and I think we all know this, you can't just, you need to infuse capital not only in the demand, but also on the supply side. 
there's a tremendous need for investing in water and sanitation infrastructure in emerging markets, and in particular at the municipal level, at those secondary and tertiary cities that are not getting the big World Bank type investments. So we actually uh, doubled our investment team uh, using philanthropy from water.org and developed over the last two years an investment strategy focused on climate resilient infrastructure across a multitude of different emerging markets. Uh, so you can see at a high level the two strategies there. Um, this is just our progression. So you can see we've, we've taken a fairly stepwise approach. Um, you know, and, and really a stepwise approach if you think about the fact that water.org started almost two decades ago, spun out water equity, sort of transitioning from just philanthropy to investment in 2016, started out really with our first fund, just $11 million in one country. And you can see, uh, if you look at fund four, which closed a couple of years ago and in which I see some of our investors in the room uh, here, I, um, we, we were able to be in, in over 20 countries in that fund. Uh, that fund is projected to reach 5 million people. Um, and I should say thus far we've reached 6 million people across our multitude of funds, but they don't sunset for quite a while. So we, we have some time. Uh, and here you see the launch of our Water and Climate Resilience Fund, which um, we actually just announced two weeks ago a press release that released the first, we were able to raise the first 100 million of that 200 million uh, in, in capital. And, uh, and so here's just a quick, overview of how you can see these are distinct. So basically, um, I'm borrowing from, from Matt Damon, our founder, who just said this, we, we sort of have an on-ramp for everyone, and in particular corporates. I know that you all are sometimes thinking about how do you get in front of your treasuries and think about you know, what's, the, what's the best way to have an investment vehicle that resonates for them. Um, we have investment strategies that are consummate with the impact we're trying to have. So we do have the Water and Climate Resilience Fund on the right. Again, this is, we still need about $100 million. This invests in projects and growth companies across the entire water value chain, really all the way from water sourcing all the way to wastewater treatment and reuse. Um, it has a private equity return profile, and I know there's some questions about that, and I'm happy to talk about it. Um, it focuses not only on access, but also on quality, improving water quality, and mitigating water scarcity, which I think are goals that a lot of your companies share. Um, and we already have, I'm proud to say, five uh, LPs that are members of the Water Resilience Coalition. Um, if you'll give me 20 more seconds, what we are also going to market with just in a couple of weeks is actually Global Access Fund 5. So that's the fifth iteration of our microfinance fund. What is different about this is this is an evergreen fund. So one of the barriers that we often have is when you have a closed fund, you have time closes, and it can be hard to meet the, treasure, the timing. This fund will always be open. And so I think that's uh, interesting. We'll continue to make loans to microfinance institutions. And that will, of course, focus on access. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Elon. And, um, and thank you, um, Kenzie. We have a, a couple of minutes. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, we have a couple of minutes for, um, for Q&A as well before we go on to Alonzo. Any, any questions for Kenzie or um, Elon? Sanjeev. A uh, question for Kenzie. Kenzie, I presume you were here when they were talking about the river basin work this morning? I was not, sorry. Oh. Okay, well, my question is going to be, uh, there is work progressing in multiple river basins. There are different types of projects. Where is the interlinkage that you see and the opportunity for your fund to invest in and contribute to those efforts? So we are, we're in the Central Valley of California, so the San Joaquin Valley, but also um, we do some work around the Sacramento River uh, Basin. We are not involved in the Colorado River, if that's what you're discussing. So I, our main area is really the Central, the Central Valley, the aquifer, that's the giant bathtub underneath the entire valley. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if there's a specific river that you're focused on, but that's really where we are. So we, we're not necessarily, we're not as focused on river um, areas in particular. Question in the back over here. There's a question for Kenzie. So it's David Grom from PepsiCo. Um, it's, it's more a curiosity than anything else. You, you gave a great example of that dairy farm that you took out of um, commission, essentially. Do you guys do some sort of a socioeconomic impact assessment in terms of, I mean, obviously that milk went to somewhere, that alfalfa went to somewhere. So when you're taking that out of the system, how does that work within the local community? Well? Sure. So that this specific example, the the feed that was being grown on the property was being fed to the cows on the same property, so the same farmer. 
Um, so the farmer obviously sold the property to us, got the return. Um, and so we weren't there. We do do an assessment and, um, and we always make sure we are very focused on the community. And uh, the thing that we really are so proud of is we've been operating in the Central Valley for 20 years. And it's a very, it's not an easy place necessarily to do business, especially if you are viewed as an outsider coming in. Um, so we are very careful and we are very integrated into the local irrigation districts and we talk to, we have great relationships with the municipalities. So it is something we take into consideration, but that specific, that specific example was kind of a closed loop. I think, I think we have one last question and then we'll continue our program. Yeah, Alex Johnson with Verity. Uh, Elon, I'll bite on uh, on your uh, question. What uh, the private equity return profile? Uh, could you uh, give us a little more detail on that? Sure. So we're actually targeting ten to twelve percent. Which, what's interesting about the portfolio is it's actually a mix of project equity and growth equity in companies. So it's actually a little bit different of a risk profile, a, lo a lower risk profile than a typical private equity fund, which is why uh, the returns are blended in that way as well. Thank you. Well, thank you to Kenzie and um, and Elon. We're really excited about the uh, the alignment of uh, of your investment funds and the investment opportunities with um, with our goals um, of the CEO Water Mandate and Water Resilience Coalition. So thank you. And um, again, I hope you stay around for our cocktail hour for Q and A. Thank you. I'm going to have to go through all of these slides. I'm sorry about this, everybody to get to Alonzo. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Alonzo Ortiz Galan from the uh, Global Impact Investing Network, which is the largest global network um, of impact investors. And um, we've been talking to um, the Jin uh, just about the work that they're, they're doing uh, on corporate impact investing and, and asked Alonzo to share with us some trends in, that they're seeing in corporate impact investing um, and a little teaser to the task force that many of you have signed up for uh, about our investment portfolio. These are some of the questions we want to explore in that task force is, you know, how can um, uh, we look at the capacity building of more companies getting involved in corporate impact investing to take advantage of these different opportunities that will advance our joint goals. So, Alonzo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Hi, everyone. I'm Alonso Ortiz from the Global Impact Investing Network. For those who aren't familiar with us, uh, we are a nonprofit dedicated to increasing the scale and effectiveness of impact investing across the globe. And a couple of years ago, we launched an initiative to engage with corporations who are exploring or executing impact investments and putting really a holistic impact investing strategies to try to pursue the, their impact goals. Uh, we've been providing them with tools to help them become much more efficient within this practice, to connect with peers and find networks globally and across themes. And we've also helped them, which is the reason why the gym was interested in exploring or building this group was connecting to impact investors. Um, we, I'm gonna describe our program in two phases uh, that now neatly fit each other. The first one was learning. When we started this initiative, we benefited from a member base of 450 uh, asset managers and asset owners from across the, across the globe. And from this group, there were already investors coming into the gene from learn to learn from others and who were already kind of quite refined within their impact investing uh, strategies. So we put together a group and we created a set of agendas and of meetings to learn what were their pain points, what were the challenges, what were the opportunities. And we collected, we had, I think, for, by now we've talked to about 100 organizations. We also benefited a lot from organizations such as Water Equity, Aqua for All, and other uh, uh, asset managers. So we put all of this into a position paper and a set of case studies what the, that we published last year. And I'll invite you all to scan this QR code <laughs> so you can access it afterwards. Uh, and our learnings can be roughly uh, described in four points. The first one, and it's not gonna be shocking, but corporations are not impact investors. And uh, we think this is critical. This is why there's so much resistance internally and externally to make this a uh, work. We've thought that it, or we've seen that it is helpful to describe it as fully. So corporations are using impact investing because capital can help them solve the challenges that other strategies, whether philanthropic or from the sustainability strategy, are not being able to help them meet. And very importantly, this is not only a philanthropic 
strategy, but also very business aligned. So typically when we see a corporation using impact investing, it's aligned with our priorities and through their business. In the case of water, it's obvious for many of you that water is related to many of the commitments that you have put together, but also it's critical to the business. So it kind of it lives in between. The second insight is that corporates and impact investors, kind of that collaboration makes a lot of sense. And at the beginning we thought it was like, only the capital that could bring these two together. When you think about the financing gap to reach the SDGs, that's another source of capital. But when you see these two actors come together, the skills and the expertise that they have is quite complementary. And we've seen and hear that across the board from both ends. So this is a new set of partnerships that can be developed if put strategically and done well. And um, the third one, the, th the third kind of insight that we've gathered from this, uh, all of these conversations is being that Corporations using impact investing are snowflakes. Each one is unique. I've never seen one corporation have an identical strategy than the other. And when you read the position paper, we try to walk people who read and engage with this, is that it's a set of choices. And these choices are aligned by the structure of the company. Your companies are very different to each other, as well as to the goals that they're trying to pursue. Some corporations are executing impact investing from the foundation because that's the way legally, strategically, that that makes sense. Or others are doing it from treasury, others from the sustainability teams. It's really kind of dependent. So there's no blueprint, there's no copy paste, and it has to done that's why we see that corporations talking to each other makes a lot of sense. And that's the fourth point. We've seen that when a corporations who care about, let's say, the same SDG or the same impact goal are more efficient at learning, at learning from each other. And that's the second phase in which we are at the gin. We are now, we've been almost for a year putting together a group of healthcare companies of many of the big names that we all know are coming together to this group. In this case, they're interested in increasing access to healthcare in emerging markets. They're now using similar strategies and they're helping each other to learn, but also kind of to bring others along the way. So it's a good way to socialize the idea, also internally. This is helping them make the business case that this makes sense. And uh, within the gene, we try to make this kind of run in kind of within two parallel groups. Impact investors are also aligning thematically. And then when you put them together with corporations, kind of the learnings and, and, and the collaborations can be catalytic. Um, so this is where we're at the moment. And just picking up on a few points that were men mentioned earlier by Josin. So agree to act. I think many of here are already kind of there. And you speak each other's languages. Maybe it's just trying to organize a set of conversations, uh, organizing what are the needs that you have in order to build uh, the expertise and the execution to kind of get you to the finish line in the case of those who, are, uh, who need a final notch to get there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think this is uh, concluding our program uh, with our um, uh, really appreciate the collaboration of all of our partners in helping us to drive the strategy forward. So thank you, big round of applause to all of you. And I'd like to now turn it over to Jason um, for, for closing remarks. Terrific session. It's gonna be hard to summarize it. I just wanna emphasize a, a couple of things here. Many companies that have been focused on water have been taking action either through philanthropy or through their sustainability teams, um, their stewardship programs. This, for many companies, is a new way or an unlock of how you can start to take action on water in ways that have a huge amount of scale. And I want to say from my experience within the WRC, and the WRC has developed a strategy, a 2030 strategy of how we will work together uh, collectively over the next few years. One of the strategies in this is about innovating new ways of financing water and bringing technological innovation to the water challenge. And you can see through th today's afternoon, th this interweaves in really interesting ways. Uh, and the learning that's happened just within the, the WRC over the last few years is huge. And to Alonso's point, the ability for peers to learn from one another, there are members of the WRC that have been leading on water for a long time but this is a new area for them. And actually the ability to learn from how some of the companies that have invested in these platforms, that conversation was fascinating. And we have a number of the companies that have been leading on this charge that have said, look, I am a CSO. If you wanna learn how I pitched this to our treasury, I'm happy to talk to you. 
And that's the type of sharing and learning that I think can accelerate progress. So for the companies, and I know some uh, have left because they've taken flights home, but for those companies that have been investing in one or more of these vehicles, if you can raise your hand so that anyone that wants to talk to you during the break to see how you've thought about it, how you've advanced that, I, I hope you'd be willing to share that knowledge and that we can share that as we move forward. Because this catalytic role, and, and I'm really excited about how we're gonna begin to start connecting this even better to the 100 basins that we're working in. I think there's a huge opportunity here. Watch this space, by this time next year, I think we're gonna be able to have a much more compelling story. If I understood your question, Sanjeev, are we connecting the work that RRG is doing in California, the answer is yes, but we haven't uh, been able to formalize that yet. But the California Water Resilience Initiative will certainly be looking for opportunities to invest in groundwater recharge. And I hope that even by our meeting in Sacramento next month, we'll be able to talk about what that could look like. So I'm gonna, we're, we're not having a break. We're going right into the next session and you're shepherding that as well. Okay, so thank you all. And I hope uh, that people can really bring this action forward because whether or not you join the mandate, or the WRC, these investment opportunities you should be taking action on, right? You, this is, there's really no reason for you not to do it. And, what, and we'd of course love for you to join the WRC, help us make that portfolio be more strategic as we move forward. But regardless, have the conversation, take action on water, make the investment. Those returns are impressive. So back over to you, Sean.